everybody. It's a great pleasure to have you all here again for a lecture by Anne Helsberg on lawfare. Obviously, uh, the, the defamation and demonization of Israel are, are global issues, and they're also totally integrated issues. So you cannot uh, look at them by just looking at one aspect of which lawfare has become very, very prominent in the last few years. Uh, obviously, lawfare in itself wouldn't be so bad uh, if it weren't integrated with other, th uh, with other things, such as, for instance, uh, we have so-called human rightists who go to, to uh, demonizers of Israel. Uh, such as uh, the human, uh, United Nations Human Rights Commission with their complaints about Israel, saying uh, we have complaints about Israel, who, who does what with them is none of our, uh, really none of our business. Uh, that these are de facto enemies uh, of, of Israel, uh, controlled to a large extent by uh, people who want to commit genocide against Israel or their supporters, that doesn't bother the human rights. So uh, you'll have to look at, you cannot fight the legitimization of Israel, of which lawfare is becoming increasingly prominent without looking at the whole picture. But you cannot understand, on the other hand, the whole picture if you do not take its key elements and try to understand them. And that's what we... Uh, we have asked uh, and to help us do because of her very, very uh, good work and publications <coughs> on uh, what, uh, a word which is, I think, is a new word, law mm -hmm. no? Yeah. Uh, which has become a new word and where Israel, as usual, is the pioneer of being its victim. Uh, <coughs> lawfare, the abuse of international law to delegitimize Israel. And is the legal advisor for NGO Monitor, which is a very, very good organization. I should mention here that it was uh, initiated here and uh, became independent a number of uh, years ago. And she deals with uh, a variety of issues, which are the main aspects of, uh, of lawfare, uh, universal jurisdiction. There also, uh, you remember the, the Belgian case against, uh, against uh, Sharon, that was the first case, it was obviously not the last. And it ended very simply because it uh, can take on little Israel, it's more difficult to take on President Bush. President Bush uh, told the Belgians that it was fine, they could take him, uh, take him on, but then he would move uh, NATO out of Belgium. Uh, the Belgians then uh, had major reconsiderations about the nature of the law and decided to change it. So. Uh, International criminal law, she deals with, and human rights law, which are probably, uh, I think, the main avenues of uh, how international law is abused uh, against Israel and uh, will soon be abused against many more people. Uh, major abuse, of course, is the United uh, Nations. She has published, not only with NGO Monitor, but also in Wall Street Journal, Arbeit, the Jerusalem Post, etc. Please. Thank you, Manfred, for having me here today. And it's nice to see a great crowd. So today when we uh, read stories about the Arab-Israeli conflict, it's practically impossible to not read about international law and hear the discourse of international law in those articles and reports. Um, you'll hear terms like collective punishment, indiscriminate attacks on civilians, disproportionate force, sieges, blockades, occupation, apartheid. Um, it's, it's impossible to read something without having one of these phrases utilized. And it's also increasingly impossible, um, not impossible, but unfortunately it's becoming quite ubiquitous, that we're reading stories about Israeli officials who have to cancel their travel plans to Europe for fear that they'll be arrested for war crimes if they go there. Uh, a couple weeks ago, the government had to cancel a strategic dialogue with the UK um, because the government could not guarantee that its officials going to the UK would not be arrested. 
Now the strategy to use um, Lawfare, and I, I sort of see two aspects to Lawfare. There's the um, use of international legal discourse on the one hand, and the other hand using legal frameworks such as courts or the UN, or national courts, um, has been around actually for many decades. Um, it was quite prevalent in the 1970s. Uh, the Arab League and the Islamic regimes in the PLO were quite effective in UN frameworks um, engaging in lawfare, and they worked very closely with the Soviet Union on those tactics. Um, but in the past 10 years or so, the primary drivers of the strategy have actually become um, non-governmental organizations that are claiming the mantle of universal human rights and humanitarian objectives to carry out the strategy. And probably what's most disturbing and surprising about these um, new campaigns taken up by NGOs is that they're carried out uh, with the funding from the European Union, many European governments, and prominent foundations like the Open Society Institute from George Soros, the Ford Foundation, and even in some cases the New Israel Fund. So the NGOs adopted the lawfare strategy um, beginning at the 2001 UN World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa. So at that event, officials from more than 1,500 NGOs, and we're not just speaking about fringe organizations, fringe Palestinian organizations, but also major global NGO superpowers like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, gathered in an NGO forum and issued a declaration um, where they declared Israel to be a racist and apartheid state and that was engaging in crimes like crimes against humanity, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, and even genocide. And as a result of these supposed crimes that Israel was engaging in, the declaration called for the complete and total isolation of Israel through boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaigns, or BDS, and also um, through the use of courts to establish an international war crimes tribunal against Israelis, or in the absence of that, um, utilizing universal jurisdiction statutes throughout the world to, in their view, punish and hold Israelis accountable for their alleged crimes. And we call this the Durban Strategy. Um, since the Durban Strategy was adopted, um, NGOs have engaged in issuing uh, probably thousands of publications by this point, also, they hold many conferences each year, sponsored by European governments, um, and lobbying campaigns um, with European governments at the European Parliament, where they advance uh, their the strategy of BDS and also um, utilizing legal frameworks to have Israelis punished. And in these in these conferences, lobbying campaigns, and reports, there are several common themes that we see. Um, the violations may differ depending on the exact situation that the groups are, are discussing. However, these themes appear um, everywhere. Um, so first you'll see accusations couched in terms of international law like war crimes, crimes against humanity, intentional targeting of civilians, collective punishment, disproportionate attacks. And these types of accusations are lodged without any real basis in law or um, uh, factual evidence to back them up. So for instance, um, a group like Human Rights Watch might accuse Israel of war crimes, but yet when they do so, they're not engaging in any sort of real legal analysis to apply that label. They simply base it on, they come up with that, um, that they, that's how they want to label the, the tactics, and then they find supposed evidence that will back up that statement. But even in those cases, they aren't really engaging in the analysis that's required under the law. So for instance, in, to have something be war crimes, it's not necessarily that, that civilians have unfortunately been killed, but rather you need to look at all the circumstances of, uh, let's say, counter-terror operation, uh, what, what knowledge was known to the military commander at the time, um, what were the um, advantages of carrying out a particular attack, where were um, the opponents such as Hamas or Hezbollah located at the time of the attack. So the NGOs involved, when they um, bring up these themes, they don't engage in that type of legal analysis. They simply apply the label. 
because it has a very powerful emotive value, and the fact that it's couched in a legal term makes it um, gives it a credibility that it otherwise wouldn't have. Other common themes are minimizing or erasing the context of terror, and similarly, delegitimizing Israel's rights to self-defense. So, um, for instance, B'Tselem or Human Rights Watch do this quite frequently. They will claim that Israel is not engaging in activities to defend its citizens from attack, uh, but rather it's simply doing things to punish Palestinians. Or other NGOs such as Amnesty International will claim that Israel is engaging in particular counter-terror operations, such as the security barrier or, or uh, let's say, checkpoints or roadblocks, simply for racist motives against um, Arabs. Another common theme that they adopt, uh, groups such as Oxfam, for instance, does this quite often, will say, well, it's okay that Israel is trying to defend its citizens, but they invariably conclude that every method that Israel takes is illegal. And they also don't suggest any realistic alternatives. So it pretty much ties Israel's hands. There's nothing they can do that would be considered legal for these organizations. And some organizations even go so far as to say not only are Israel's counter-terror operations illegal, attacks on Israeli civilians are actually legal forms of what they call resistance. And groups such as the Palestinian Center for Human Rights, which you'll be hearing a lot about today, is the primary, um, it's a purveyor of this type of theme. Another common theme is that there are no human shields. So Gaza or uh, Hezbollah controlled Lebanon, um, they, they ignore or deny um, that, these, that these terror groups deliberately operate out of civilian areas and that they hide their weaponry within mosques or hospitals or schools or other civilian installations. And finally, probably the most important theme in terms of lawfare is that they try to portray the Israeli justice system as illegitimate and incapable of conducting credible investigations. So even though the Israeli Supreme Court, for instance, is probably the most open court in the world in terms of the ability to bring a claim, there are virtually no um, limitations for individuals to bring claims in, in the Supreme Court here, um, even for individuals that have no real connection to the events at issue, they're allowed to. And also, the Israeli Supreme Court is very aggressive in terms of applying principles of international law, international human rights, humanitarian law, and has been commended for doing so. And they're, they're willing to, um, to rule on cases on virtually every aspect of counter-terror operations, and they've even done so while military operations were underway. And that's quite unusual. You would never see that in the U.S. or the U.K. So those types of cases would be dismissed immediately for being um, political questions that the judiciary is not capable of, of um, ruling on. We've also seen in our research several methodological problems in this NGO reporting. So oftentimes these NGOs will raise military claims in their reports, yet they're based upon little or no military expertise. Um, Human Rights Watch was a very notorious uh, case, but their, their former senior military advisor actually had to resign last year because he was an obsessive collector of Nazi memorabilia. And it turned out that he was the one who had been responsible for writing several of the reports on Israel. And he purported to have military expertise. We have been able to, unable to corroborate any of that expertise. Um, and he would issue reports making claims about weapons, weapon systems, um, the types of operations, the types of uh, making damage assessments, that when it turned out you would ask actual experts about these claims, they would invariably conclude that, that Mr. Garlasco didn't really know what he was talking about. And we saw that in countless uh, reports of HRW. And since he's been fired, there has been little to no uh, reassessment of those reports to, to go back and see if, if um, to correct those, those um, claims. Another serious problem is that a lot of NGOs, when they issue these reports, they're doing so in closed and highly managed environments. So when they're in Gaza or in Hezbollah-controlled Lebanon, they are minded the entire time by those officials. And anyone they meet with is vetted prior to and after the meetings. 
Therefore, much of the information that they're being given cannot be treated as reliable, and it's impossible to verify it. Um, also, when they conduct their reporting, very few, if any, list any uh, standards or guidelines <laughs> in terms of their activities. So we have no way of knowing how their <laughs> investigations are carried out, how they've selected witnesses or incidents to evaluate. Similarly, um, they primarily rely on unverifiable witness testimony. So again, there's no way to corroborate what these witnesses are saying. There's no way of knowing how these witnesses were chosen. Um, there have been several instances um, in the Gaza War. There was one man who actually his, his case was um, <coughs> referred to repeatedly in the Goldstone Report. And it turned out when you looked at media accounts of, of his case, he gave 15 to 20 different versions of what happened to him. So it's impossible to, to know what really happened in those instances. Um, another common problem is that they will often broad, draw broad conclusions based simply on a few anecdotes. So Human Rights Watch, for instance, um, looked at six cases where they claimed Israel illegally employed the use of the smoke obscurant waste white phosphorus, which is in fact legal under international law, but they claimed it was illegal. And from that, they drew a broad conclusion that Israel was engaging in mass war crimes during the Gaza War. Other issues are ideological biases. Again, I'm using HRW because they seem to have all of these problems. Um, their Middle East department is head, headed by two former pro-Palestinian activists, and m numerous researchers in that department have pro-Palestinian backgrounds. And finally, there's a lack of transparency and accountability. Again, oftentimes we don't know who is writing these reports, who they're meeting with, and accountability, if they make claims and then it turns out they're wrong, they're, they're, um, there's no mechanism to hold them accountable for those errors. So in the Lebanon war, there was a very um, notorious incident where there was a bombing in the town of Kana, and that actually changed the course of the war. Israel had to call a ceasefire for a couple days. And HRW immediately issued a press release that 56 people had been killed. Well, in actuality, about 28 people were killed, and it's still unclear how many of those were Hezbollah fighters. And HRW, the Red Cross actually issued those numbers at the same time HRW issued its report, and it knew of the Red Cross report. So it deliberately inflated the num doubled the numbers, again for the emotive impact. And yet, if Later, they, they acknowledged that only 28 people had been killed in that incident. However, they, that original press release is still available on their website, and they have never issued any apologies. So although we have these themes that seem to reflect bias and, let's say, distortion of international law and methodological problems, um, due to what we call the halo effect, where organizations, because they're dealing, they claim to deal with human rights, their, their um, claims are automatically granted a certain credibility. Their, their stories and reports are immediately picked up in the media and used at the UN and in European capitals um, to support charges of war crimes against Israelis. And you don't see, again, any independent verification of these claims. And finally, it's picked up in, the, in academia and can have long-lasting impacts in terms of um, the record. And we've seen this over and over again, Janine in 2002, the ICJ opinion against the security barrier in 2004, the Lebanon War, uh, the Gaza War, the Goldstone process, and of course last year's IS, IHH ISM flotilla. Now, one might say, oh, okay, so what's the big deal? They have these conferences and they issue these reports, it's just a bunch of you know, idealistic do-gooders, you know, issuing, you know, blowing smoke, issuing these emotive uh, reports. However, they have very concrete and significant effects for both the Israeli government, but also Western governments in general. Um, these re reports are used for the exploitation of legal frameworks, uh, both internationally and nationally. So internationally, we of course had the, IC, the International Court of Justice advisory opinion on the security barrier, and there have been calls since then to have one on the Gaza war, and also um, to have the court rule on whether Israel is a colonial and apartheid state. Um, and that actually is a campaign that was spearheaded by the Israeli NGO Adela, 
that is funded by the New Israel Fund among and many European governments, as well as the Palestinian NGO Al Haq, and we'll be hearing about both of those groups in a minute. There are calls for ICC prosecutions or ad hoc criminal tribunals. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit more about that in depth. At the moment, Israel is not a party to the criminal court, and therefore its nationals cannot be brought to trial there. However, um, these, inter these, let's say, alternative uh, methods in, in international frameworks and in national courts is, are being used right now because that is the case. However, the ultimate prize for these NGOs would be to have an Israeli go to The Hague and be tried. And we may be getting close to that, and I'm going to speak about that in a minute. But that, that's sort of the, uh, the holy grail for these organizations. Um, another thing they do is heavily lobby UN bodies, the Human Rights Council, um, um, other UN frameworks. So we had the Goldstone Inquiry. They've had an inquiry on the flotilla. And this is quite significant. Um, in human rights bodies at the UN, NGO reporting on internet and um, interpretations of international law are quite influential. So last year, Israel was reviewed by the Committee Against Torture, which oversees its compliance with the Convention Against Torture. And it turned out that in their final report, they condemned Israel for torture on the basis of house demolitions, its water policy, and its Gaza policies. Now, if you look at the Convention of Torture, that is not the intention of that treaty. That treaty is intended to deal with detention situations or people who are or treatment while being imprisoned. And because of a report from Amnesty International, which brought these very novel and unique interpretations of international law, those were then adopted by the committee. So we see that happening in many of these UN human rights frameworks. And then also you have national efforts. So there's lobbying in European capitals for sanctions and arms embargoes. I was in uh, Dublin in June testifying before the parliament there. They had drafted a motion to um, encourage the EU to suspend the EU-Israel Association Agreement based upon the reporting of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. So you can see these can have very far-ranging effects. Also, we have the universal jurisdiction cases, which are most troubling for um, not only the government, but the individuals who are being harassed with these lawsuits. Um, so, for, in and for instance, the internet, the, um, let's say, fact-finding investigations that Goldstone, for instance, which was a direct result of, of um, NGO campaigning at the Human Rights Council, calls for the use of universal jurisdiction against Israel. And I'll note that in the Goldstone report, they are only calling for universal jurisdiction against Israel. They are not calling for it against members of Hamas. So it's a very one-sided call. And they have also called for the International Criminal Court to intervene. Similarly, the Arab League, which worked very closely with the Palestinian Center for Human Rights in its invest investigation, um, calls for another ICJ advisory opinion, Security Council referrals to the criminal courts, um, prosecutions of Israelis in national courts for not only the Fourth Geneva Convention, but also for genocide. And in national frameworks, we see that these reports are being used to bolster BDS. So we have um, boycotts. Next week, actually, in the UK is the Palestinian Lobby Day. And basically, they're going to be targeting members of the UK Parliament to implement boycotts and sanctions against Israel. So a group of several NGOs, not just, again, the fringe Palestinian NGOs, but very prominent charities like War on Want and Christian Aid, will be taking part in these events. They have also, um, again, like I said, called for, for the um, suspension of the EU-Israel Israel Association Agreement. And this is despite the fact that the EU also has association agreements with Libya, with Algeria, with Egypt. So again, you can see the very biased nature of these calls. No one was calling for the Libyan-EU Association Agreement to be uh, revoked. And also, they tried to block uh, prominent, actually church-based humanitarian groups in Europe, Trocra, Trocra, 
uh, Diaconia from Sweden and Christian Aid were very active in trying to block Israel from entry into the OECD. <coughs> and then we have NGO abuse of universal jurisdiction. Now, universal jurisdiction allows courts to rule on cases even though the parties and events at issue are wholly foreign. So, for instance, the court in Spain can rule on what happened, under these laws, could rule on what happened in Gaza, even though there are no Spanish victims involved, the perpetrators were not Spanish, nothing occurred on Spanish soil, and no Spanish nationals were implement, implicated in any of the events. Now, and I, I'll add just as a side note that in Spain it's illegal to investigate Franco, the events surrounding Franco, so it's quite ironic that Spanish courts can investigate what's happening in Gaza, yet they're unable to investigate the crimes of Franco. Um, but these, these statutes were originally enacted to remedy gross abuses of human rights, cases of mass atrocities, mass murder, um, mass torture, where there's no rule of law in that jurisdiction. Um, and traditionally, these statutes, especially in the U.S., were adopted to cover things like piracy that had no um, national jurisdiction. They were taking place out at sea, so there was no sovereign involved, and that's why it was decided that any country could, could rule on these types of cases. Now, a complicating factor in these universal jurisdiction um, statutes in several European countries is that private individuals can go to a magistrate judge and apply for an arrest warrant. So while, let's say, in the U.S. or in Canada, that would not be allowed, in countries like the U.K., in Spain, the Netherlands, um, in Belgium, I think you still can do that, although they've changed their law a little bit, um, it allows people to abuse the system, where they can go, and without any government official knowing, they can apply to get an arrest warrant from a magistrate judge, and the, the uh, standard is actually very low for the arrest warrant to be issued, especially in the U.K. So the other thing is that once that arrest warrant is issued, um, then the government could step in and say, okay, we do or do not want to prosecute. But it, to me it seems kind of backwards that these private individuals could have someone arrested and then it's declared that, no, this isn't a case we wish to pursue. Um, it's, you know, it's very harassing. But this is, this is what many of the um, NGOs we cover have been, have been doing to execute their political agenda. And as we see, there's been probably about a dozen cases filed over the past 10 years. As Manfred uh, mentioned, it began with Ariel Sharon in Belgium. There have been many cases in the UK to try to have officials arrested. Dawon Amog, a very a famous case in 2005 where he didn't get off his airplane, otherwise he would have been arrested. Uh, last year, there were attempts to arrest Ehud Barak and Sipi Livni. In 2004, they tried to have Sholem Alfaz arrested. And we've also seen that in Spain. Um, in the U.S., there have been civil cases against Israeli officials. And there's also many cases against companies or governments doing business with Israel to bolster the BDS movement. Now, to date, all of these cases have been unsuccessful. They've all been dismissed. Um, many of the cases um, have had numerous appeals and gone up to the Supreme Court in Spain, in the UK, in, in um, Canada. And those courts have all found that the cases are without merit. But the idea isn't really, I mean, it would be a great bonus for these organizations if they could have an Israeli arrested or, or civilly uh, found liable. But the real um, objective here is for the PR and for the associative impact to have Israel associated with war crimes. And eventually they hope that in the future they, they will have some success. Also, it's important to note that many of these cases involve uh, mass forum shopping. So, um, several of the cases um, were actually tried in Israel. In some of the cases, the plaintiffs were even successful. And yet, these organizations are shopping the cases to many jurisdictions around the world in the hopes that they will get a more favorable result. And as I mentioned, these cases pretty much fall under two categories. We have criminal cases, and you can see the various countries that these cases have been brought. Um, the primary leaders of the strategy are the Palestinian Center for Human Rights. They've been aided by the Israeli NGO Adala. 
Yesh Gvul. Um, Palestinian NGOs Amazon and Al Haq are quite um, involved in the strategy, and they've they've enlisted the help of Daniel Macover, who's an attorney in Britain, who also happens to be an expatriate Israeli. And the, the interesting thing is, most of the criminal cases are surrounding the 2002 targeted killing of Saleh Shahada, who is a, a main um, Hamas terror operative. And so PCHR has been trying to have Israel held accountable for this counter-terror operation in the UK, in Spain, in the US, in New Zealand. And I assume they're going to keep trying wherever they can until what they, they feel they've obtained, obtained justice for this incident. Um, also, um, they've tried to litigate the Gaza War and uh, Operation Rainbow in Rafah in 2004. We also see civil lawsuits against Israeli officials. Those are primarily in the U.S. because there's no uh, right of action for criminal cases under universal jurisdiction. And another common aspect of these cases is that it's inherent, they're inherently biased. We don't see um, these so-called universal human rights groups bringing any cases against Hamas terrorists, Hezbollah, Iranian officials, Syrian officials for supporting that strategy. Um, and they cause severe interference with diplomatic relations. It's very embarrassing, not only for Israel, but for the countries who are being targeted by these lawsuits. And I would add that it's quite ironic that many of the countries that are providing these organizations with the funding to engage in that, this activity have been, themselves been targeted with these lawsuits. So again, one needs to ask, you know, whenever you meet with the European official, you should ask them, why are you funding, this why are you funding these activities? They're completely trying to undermine your foreign policy and the policies you're trying to promote in the region. Also, there are circumvention of democratic processes. Rather than going through legislature or elections or other types of democratic processes, they're trying to get uh, relief through the judiciary. Um, the other aspect of the campaigns are or to bolster the BDS movement. So we'll see civil lawsuits against corporations doing business with Israel, as well as civil lawsuits against other government officials. And Al Haq is the primary perpetrator of these cases. Um, although C uh, the Center for Constitutional Rights in the U.S. P and PCHR um, are, are also actively involved in these cases, as well as the Israeli attorney Michael Spard, who you may have heard of, who is the legal advisor for Peace Now, Yeshdin, and Breaking the Silence. He's, very, he's been very active in some of these cases. And big groups like Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International provide a lot of logistical support for these cases, publicizing them, um, having rallies, and other events to promote these cases. <clears throat> and in the UK, Al Haq actually brought two cases in the UK to try to have um, arms export licenses revoked with Israel. And in that case, um, they were aided by Amnesty and Oxfam, who then lobbied in UK Parliament to have um, have this ban enforced, and they were actually partially successful. So, it, so it is a worrying um, phenomenon. And again, these cases are are trying to do a few things. Number one, they're trying to get judicial enforcement of the 2004 ICJ opinion on the security barrier. It's important to note that the secu the ICJ opinion was an advisory opinion, so it has no binding legal authority. So, what these because and these NGOs were very unhappy about that. So what they've done is they start filing cases in Europe, in, in North America, to try to have that um, as a judicially enforced opinion. Also, they, it's a way to circumvent foreign sovereign immunity laws. So in many countries, you would not be able to directly sue Israeli, the Israeli government or Israeli officials for some of these activities. So instead, they sue uh, corporations that engage with the Israeli government or other governments um, that engage with the Israeli government. And it's a way to also judicially impose BDS, to have a, have a judge say, yes, we will block uh, the UK trade relations with Israel, which is what Al Haq asked the UK, uh, UK court to do. And also to have um, Israeli policies declared illegal, such as settlement policy or the policies on the security barrier or the Gaza, Gaza policies. Um, so the Palestinian Center for Human Rights is probably the most well-known of, of these NGOs. And as you can see, it gets quite a bit of funding from European governments. It has filed cases, like I had mentioned, in Spain, the UK, and elsewhere. It was the logistical coordinator for the Arab League and the Goldstone missions in Gaza. 
And it, as I mentioned also, um, deems rocket attacks on Israeli civilians to be resistance. Now, I, I authored a study a couple years ago on these types of cases, and in a couple weeks I'm issuing an updated version, which I have a proof here. And what I found when I was doing some research to update my work was that in 2005, the EU gave a grant to PCHR surreptitiously. It gave 300,000 euro to Oxfam Novib, who then channeled that money to PCHR. And what did PCHR do with that money? They held strategy conferences around Europe, in Cairo, in London, in Spain. They had all their lawyers together, and luckily for me, they, PCHR had issued a report where they described in great detail what they did. So they held these strategy conferences and basically put their cases together, which they then subsequently filed. Now the interesting thing is if you look in the EU databases, there's no mention that PCHR got this money. And what's also interesting is this money was given under the auspices of an EU program against the death penalty. But in this case, it was given, as you can see in, in, on the slide, to abolish Israeli military, um, to abolish extrajudicial um, executions carried out by the Israeli military. Now, if you look at the other programs they funded under this death penalty project, not, not one other program dealt with the laws of armed conflict. It dealt with traditionally what you would think of the death penalty in, um, for criminal punishment. And the other interesting fact, and, and notice that NATO lately has been engaging in quite a few uh, executions via targeted killings, and no money was, let's say, given to the, you know, to a British NGO to investigate British um, uh, extrajudicial executions. So that, that you can see is a very one-sided um, one sided grant. But also the interesting thing was when the, e the EU hired an, 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 a group of independent auditors to audit all of these death penalty uh, programs, and when they got to look at the Oxfam PCHR program, there was no information available in the file. So they could not offer any evaluation of this program. So to this day, we still don't know why was this money given, what was the purpose, and why the EU thought that this was a good use of taxpayer funding. And here I have a slide of um, one of these strategy conferences. This one was held in Cairo in 2008. And you can see it's a conference on prosecution of Israeli war criminals. And at the bottom of the banner, there's very prominently displayed the EU logo, in addition to the Oxfam logo. Um, I'll just briefly run through some of the other organizations involved in these cases. Um, I had mentioned Adela, funded by the New Israel Fund, among others. Um, and they, they have aided PCHR in their case in Spain. They helped file an affidavit claiming that the Israeli justice system um, could not provide justice um, for Palestinians and that there was no due process in Israel. And this was a strategy that they actually developed several months prior at a, at a conference funded by the Swedish government where they, they enacted, they came up with a strategy to portray Israel as an inherently undemocratic state, in their words. Um, in addition, they've issued a study with Al Haq, like I'd also mentioned, um, to show that Israel is in a colonial apartheid state. It repeatedly um, files papers at the UN calling Israel a racist country with racist policies, lobbies for sanctions against Israel, and has also had several private meetings with the prosecutor at the International Criminal Court to bring cases against Israel. Al Haq is another NGO primarily involved in the BDS lawfare cases um, in the UK and then in Canada, and they've just recently filed a case in the Netherlands against a, a company there. And it's interesting to note their general director has been denied travel visas by the by Israel and Jordan on numerous occasions for because he's been ha found to have alleged ties to the PFLP. The Center for Constitutional Rights is also involved primarily in the cases in the U.S. Um, with PCHR, although they've also filed cases against U.S. officials in Germany and France. And they, uh, you may have heard of them because uh, a couple months ago they filed a case with the ACLU to block the targeted killing of Sheikh Alaki, uh, the U.S. citizen who's now living in Yemen and has been involved in several uh, terror attacks on the U.S. or attempted terror attacks on the U.S. And their, their head, Michael Ratner, is a 
uh, was involved in the Viva Palestina mission to Gaza last year and is also involved in a supposed upcoming flotilla this fall. Um, so, as I mentioned, the ultimate prize for these organizations would be to have NGO, uh, to have Israelis tried at The Hague. Now, they're, they got a little closer to their goal uh, last year because the Palestinian Authority in January of 2009 filed a declaration at the International Criminal Court claiming, purporting to accept the jurisdiction of the court so that the court could open investigations against Israelis. Now, this was highly improper or unusual because the uh, statute for the court only allows states to do such a thing, and at the moment the PA is not a recognized state. So the office of the prosecutor at the court should have just immediately dismissed this declaration, but he did not do so. And for the past two years almost, he's been conducting a very public debate over this issue. He, uh, he published an op-ed in the New York Times. He has uh, created this global law for forum at UCLA Law School that's on the internet, where you can read all about the PA declaration. And he's also had several meetings with NGOs, a lot of NGOs we've been discussing, HRW, Amnesty, al Haq, PCHR, Adela, the Public Committee Against Torture in Israel. Um, so they've met with him on numerous occasions to lobby on behalf of the PA Declaration. And just a few weeks ago, I was in The Hague in an NGO roundtable um, where they were invited to present their position on why the PA Declaration should be supported. And they're also working with the PA on helping them with, their, with the PA's brief. What's unusual is the PA has actually not submitted a brief yet to the court which is quite unusual. Many scholars and, and NGOs have submitted to the court either for or against the PA's position, but the PA itself has still not submitted anything final. So these NGOs are actually working with, with the PA to help them develop their brief. And it's unclear what's going to happen. Um, some people thought that after this NGO meeting a couple weeks ago that he would issue a decision whether to move forward in the next month or so. I don't know if that will happen. Um, and other people have said that because it's such a political hot potato, if he does decide to go forward, um, he might push it off. His term ends January 2012, and he might just push it off until then and leave it for the next person. But if the PA, if the PA declaration is accepted, it will certainly cause a lot of havoc at the courts, because that means pretty much any non-state actor could start filing, um, filing uh, for investigations at the court. You'll have Tibet. Uh, against China, Taiwan, um, Chechnya, um, Nagorno-Karabakh, like you can think of just about, every, it will cause chaos at the court if, if this decides to go forward. <coughs> the, a panel of judges actually has to approve uh, the decision of the prosecutor to move forward, and so it probably would be unlikely that any, in, any case against Israel would move forward. I don't think the court would accept that, but seeing as this is uh, UN justice, you never know what's going to happen. <laughs> um, and then just to wrap up, other forms of NGO lawfare are not just targeting Israel um, officials, but they've also targeted private charities um, and Jewish groups um, for being collaborators with the Zionist regime. Uh, they file libel suits. We've had two libel suits filed against us by NGOs who've tried to block um, us releasing our research about them. Luckily, they've been dismissed, those cases. Um, and also, there have been attempts to take away charitable status of Jewish organizations. So in Canada, you had um, Again David Adom actually um, had their status taken away for a while. I think it got it back, but this is a deliberate strategy of these organizations as well. Um, so just to wrap up, it's important that people are aware of this phenomenon and the actors involved. And it's most important, again, to, to go to the funders, to European governments, these large foundations, and ask them why they're engaging in this counterproductive, act, funding counterproductive activity. Um, certainly not bringing peace any closer to the region. It's pretty much, it's inflaming the conflict, in my opinion. And also it's important for people to go to the NIF and ask them to, to enact red, red lines on why they're supporting these types of activities. If they do support Israel as a Jewish state, which they claim to, why are they funding these activities that inherently are um, working against that? 
And also it's important, I think, for people to develop counter strategies, whether that means um, engaging in counter lawfare or other similar activities. I take questions. Let me just uh, already intermediate thanks to you. And let me just make uh, one, one remark. Because you said something uh, you can when you talk to individuals who serve. Since last week I was in Ottawa at the Interparliamentary Conference to Combat Anti Semitism, at a cocktail running to the Austrian ambassador, uh, say to the man, uh, uh, how come that the Viennese uh, Municipal Council has condemned Israel? How many criminal towns have they condemned? And what are the apologies of your former presidents, Klestil, Klima, Prime Ministers like Vranitsky, uh, presidents like Fischer? What are their words? Have you Austrians not learned anything? Obviously, an ambassador is not used to this kind of cocktail conversation. And I am assured that of all the Beatle people he met at that cocktail, the only thing he will remember were, were my remarks. May not make me <coughs> exceptionally popular with him, but my popularity at the Austrian ambassador in Ottawa is relatively irrelevant <laughs> to me. So uh, you can do uh, certain things which uh, leave a little bit of an, of an impression. If another 10 people do that, that Ten future cocktails, the guy will uh, will report home, uh, and these are little things you do. They cost zero, and the return is relatively uh, relatively nice. Uh, I have so far only Professor Rafael Israeli. I have uh, Professor Wagner. I have Andrew Belcom. I have Professor Kornitzer. So we take them. Uh, uh, let's take them two by two at its. Uh, this moment, unless the the questions increase rarely. Uh, Rafi first, Leslie second. Okay, well, thank you very much for the illuminating uh, remarks you had to make. I, I have a, a general remark and then a substantive question. Uh, the general remark is that uh, my impression is that as we speak about lawfare, and there is a lot of writing around it and so on, it has become a topic unto itself. And, uh, and I think it, there is something wrong there because it has to be associated with the general background where it comes from. And it is part and parcel, no doubt about it, of, of what is called since September 11, the asymmetrical war. Uh, that it be, and I think it, that has to be stressed because the, the theoreticians of that war, there is Mr. Kubeshi who, who wrote some big treaties right after September 11, he said that the purpose, since we cannot overwhelm uh, Israel and the West and so on, in military ways and so on and so forth, so we have to fight against them uh, the judicial way. And then, therefore, lawfare has become exactly uh, part of that. Uh, if you see, if you show on television, and you have to win television to your side, uh, a tank against civilians, no matter what the civilians do, they will always win, public opinion, so on and so forth. And this is exactly dramatic manifestation of that tactic. And therefore, when you say lawfare, say asymmetrical war mm -hmm. and this is one of the manifestations of it so this is a general remark uh, secondly and this is my question uh, i have been writing now a book about blood libel mm -hmm. and and uh, as you develop that issue uh, you come across a, a novel let's say um uh, gamut of, uh, of events which are happening throughout the world that I, I call blood libel derivatives. Mm -hmm. Because it's not blood libel proper as we are used it, uh, to history, but you know, the flotilla, mm -hmm. the, the, go uh, the organ so. trade uh, mm -hmm. from Sweden, uh, and, uh, and that kind of, or the Dura mm -hmm. affair and so on, are all blood libel derivatives mm -hmm. because they are connected to blood and and the accusation is there and so on and so forth. So, uh, I, I'm, uh, are we entitled then 
uh, to uh, perhaps expand the definition of lawfare, not simply those things, uh, well, they are not simple, uh, all those uh, things that you have described that criminalize Israel one way or another, but rather uh, this kind of blood libel derivatives uh, against Israel. Are we entitled to include those within the definition of lawfare? I think there are aspects. Yeah, uh, oh, okay, sorry. Okay. Who is okay. behind you? Behind you. Behind right. uh, thank you very much for uh, a remarkably comprehensive <laughs> view. It's a bit depressing. Um, the impression given is an, of an inexorable, uh, inexorable rise from Durban mm -hmm. to Israelis ending up in the Hague. Mm -hmm. So I want to just ask you. And what was missing, of course, is the, the resistance to these pressures. We know NGO Monitor. I wonder if you could say something uh, uh, of your view, if you're willing to give it, or just generally comment on the resistance to this from the Israeli government in particular, how, whether, how, what the Israeli government has been doing to resist this uh, rise and pressure, and how effective it's been. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'll first take the blood libel question. I think there are several aspects of lawfare that could fit into, or asymmetrical warfare, as you said, um, could fit into the blood libel. Um, I think the Goldstone Report is a good example of that. Um, the claims that Israel is intentionally killing civilians. Um, there may have been mistakes made. Um, there certainly were many civilians that were killed in the, in the past Gaza operation. But I don't think there's any um, evidence, except within maybe a couple of isolated incidents, that it was a deliberate policy of the Israeli government to specifically kill um, Palestinian civilians. And if that was the goal, they didn't, you know, do a very good job because they really could have, unfortunately, killed many more people had they wanted to. And so I do think that that that, that claim, which we had, which we saw in Goldstone, and which is ubiquitous in all the filings that I've seen at the at the International Criminal Court is a theme that is um, continually played out by non-governmental organizations and then adopted subsequently by academics and in UN frameworks. Um, so I do think it does in some cases meet that definition. Um, in terms of counter, countering lawfare, um, I think the Israeli government is becoming more aware of the problem. Um, they're kind of in a hard position. In some cases with, for instance, the International Court of Justice, um, the Israeli government, and also the Goldstone uh, mission would be a good example, the flotilla investigation. Um, there's a tension whether or not they should cooperate in these activities or just ignore them. I don't think they can ignore them. And I think also what we've seen actually with the Goldstone mission, even though they didn't cooperate with Goldstone, over the past year the Israeli government has released several reports um, giving its version of events to what happened in Gaza to try to debunk some of the claims. Um, but again, it's this tension, they're not quite sure how to react to it. With the national cases, um, they are more involved, um, especially in the case in Spain. They um, provided a lot of information to the court regarding, invest regarding internal Israeli investigations over the Shahada targeted killing. And because of that, the Spanish court dismissed the case. So I do think it, it would be effective um, in certain forum. I don't think the UN is effect, an effective forum because I don't think, it, even if Israel had cooperated with Goldstone, I don't think, uh, based on other information that was given to Goldstone, he would have just twisted it anyway. So I don't, I don't fault the government for not cooperating with Goldstone. But I think in these national courts, it is good for the government um, to participate. Because cause I've seen in terms of the decisions that, that have come out, there is a lot of sympathy for the Israeli position. Um, and certainly in the US, the UK, Canada, Spain, the courts are sensitive to the fact this is a situation of asymmetrical warfare. It is a, it is a means of abusing their judicial systems. And so in those cases, it, it does make sense for the government to cooperate. Uh, Leslie? No, I'm not the answer to Leslie. Oh, yes, I just came. Just answer. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Andrew, welcome, uh, Professor Marcel. Thank you very much for your, your excellent talk. There were two points I wanted to ask you. First is you didn't mention Israeli academics. Uh, one of the big issues in the UK, certainly, 
is um, Israeli academics running around Britain leading Israel Apartheid Week, speaking here, there and everywhere, which gives credibility because they're Israelis. And the second thing was just what you mentioned. There have been problems in the UK about the judiciary because, for example, there was a particular case, the EDL case, where mm -hmm. a factory was trashed, right. uh, £200,000 of damage, and the, and the case got dismissed because it was legitimate because of what Israel did in Gaza, right. Right. stated by the judge. Uh, and I wondered again if there was anything going on in these areas that uh, you could uh, tell us about. Okay. Uh, next one, Marcel. Thank you for your talk. I, <clears throat> I would like to hear you about more about the history of these universal jurisdictions. The impression, of course, that we, it's an awful oppression, it's all against Israel. I think the most famous case in the UK was not against Israel, right. it was Pinochet. Right. So could you, uh, again, and is there any case pending in New Zealand, for instance? I, I mean, you have to give a historical perspective on things that seem so awful how you presented them. My second uh, remark is that I heard your position that even if Israel would have collaborated with Goldstone, it would not change anything. A few things that I learned from the from the newspaper is that Israel is reviewing all cases, and you said they are rebunking them. I heard also that some cases are real problems, and mm -hmm. they have to go. So why not be proactive and doing something? Maybe you're right; it would not have changed anything. But I I I'm sad that Israel was not proactive in this. Okay. Okay. Um, so first. Um Dealing with the case of Israeli academics, um, you know, I wouldn't want to squelch anybody's right to go speak anywhere. So, unfortunately, a lot of the organizations we track do exploit Israelis because they're Israelis or Jews and utilize them um, for their political campaigns. And there's plenty of Israelis who agree with those um, with those views and they participate. So it's an unfortunate phenomenon, but I don't think there's a lot that can be done about it in particular. Um, I, you are right about that one case um, where this factory was destroyed and the judge, um, the judge dismissed the case against these, the vandals. Um, but I think he was actually then harshly rebuked for issuing that decision. And it turned out he was some, I don't know, some sort of rogue situation. But I think when, um, in most cases, the courts have been pretty fair-minded about it. But I've also heard in, in um, the UK, I mean, it, it probably would make good sense to start um, trying to have Palestinian officials or Iranian officials arrested, because I think if you start targeting them, harassing them, um, things against Israel probably stop, because they aren't going to like it if it's done to them. And in terms of BDS and similar cases in the UK, and also in France, um, there's been some success um, uh, trying trying those activists on um, anti-racism uh, statutes. So there has been some success on that, so that might be another potential avenue people could take. Um, in terms of the historical context, you're right. Um, so universal jurisdiction um, has been, like I said, it's been around really since the 1700s to deal with piracy. Um, and you could say also the it's not quite universal jurist well, I won't say that's a good uh, good example, but it was it was um, I'd say in the seventies there was a movement to start um, to start passing these universal jurisdiction statutes to start implementing the International <coughs> Criminal Court, which is not directly universal jurisdiction, but it's an offshoot of it. And then um, in the late eighties, actually the International Criminal Court came about. Um, one of the impetuses for it was that Caribbean countries wanted a court where they could help uh, try drug traffickers because they were unable to do it themselves and they thought that this might be a good way for them to combat that. Then, in, then you had the seminal case in the UK in 1998 against Pinochet and that sort of was the beginning of this movement. <laughs> and it's definitely, it, has, it isn't just targeting Israelis, I wouldn't want to misrepresent that, that Israelis are the only people being targeted. Um, with these types of cases, but I'm unaware of other cases um, where the organizations that we cover that are very active in the um, in the human rights community are as active in bringing in the cases that in the organizations that are that are specifically involved in the Arab-Israeli conflict that are as active in these cases. They're only against Israel, although you do have cases um, China against China, Russia. 
uh, the U.S. Um, Sudan. Been, yeah. Sudan. Sudan, right. Now, I think um, case, some cases, like let's say against the Sudanese or the Rwandese, are actually legitimate uses of universal jurisdiction because those countries mm -hmm. do not have functioning judiciaries. So they have no means of investigating and trying perpetrators for these types of mass crimes because their, their justice systems are not functioning. And you could even say for Russia that you know has a very corrupt justice system, um, and the Chinese as well. Um, so I think that is a, that is a distinction. Um, but, I, but I would say the U.S. is definitely um, caught up in this dilemma as well. It's not just Israel, but the U.S. is facing it, and I suspect um, many other Western countries are, gonna, are going to be targeted as well in the future. Uh, last question, no, two questions, more questions. Mervyn Duboff and Yusuf Afidia. Mervyn. Thank, thank you for your depressing summary of, of the situation. Uh, I wonder though whether it's really not too late. The horse has already bolted and, and the battle has been lost. Uh, you only have to look at, say, talkbacks on, on the internet Everyone knows that everything Israel does is illegal, immoral, and unjust. And, and maybe it's a waste of time trying to, to fight them on this ground, on this battleground, which they've already, when they've already run the battle. And maybe we need to find some completely different way to, to uh, attack this, this sort of thing. Quite, uh, move, move, the, move the goalposts, do something to get, a, get off the field which they've already claimed. Uh, My question is, what is being done, or what can be done, to reverse this demonization of Israel in the world public? Um, okay, so the questions are somewhat related. Um, I don't think we should give up yet. <laughs> I think it's definitely an uphill battle, but I think more and more people that um, you know, are outraged by these types of things. It does have an impact. Oftentimes when we meet with European officials, a lot of them aren't even aware of this going on, and when they find out about it, they're very um, disturbed by it. We've had a few successes, not many, but we're slowly getting more and more. Um, and also in terms of, you know, the, like the, the UK government, for instance, has been desperately, I don't know if they'll actually do anything, but they've at least been talking about changing their laws to try to remedy some of these situations. So I don't think all hope is lost, um, but I do think it's important to show that, you know, Israel is kind of the little Satan here. Um, it's an easy target. It's much harder to go after the U.S. Um, or other NATO countries, and that, you know, once it becomes acceptable to do it against Israel, it will make it much easier to start targeting other Western countries. And I think if people see it in that context of, um, of asymmetrical war, um, that perhaps um, they could be motivated to move. And if, even if you look at in the, what's happening in the U.S. now, I mean, you have the U.S. State Department um, speaking about how targeted killings are, are legal forms of self-defense and even preemptive self-defense. And so that we probably wouldn't have seen maybe seven or eight years ago. But the U.S. even is realizing that a lot of these counterterror measures are actually quite necessary and important in, in the battles that... Um, that we're facing these days. And so if you look at, at um, actual, um, like international law isn't just, let's say, these pronouncements, but it's also the practice of states. And if you look at state practice, it's actually quite more aligned with what Israel's doing than what like many of these NGOs say. So I think when you start raising those points, perhaps um, it could have an impact on, on changing the discourse and the narrative. Um, in terms of what else we can be doing, like I said, I think the like doing it back to um, Iranian officials, Hezbollah officials is important. Um, also, again, just stressing the um, stressing um, how putting it in the context of asymmetrical war is important, and also again, like maybe utilizing these other unknown. Uh, methods such as utilizing the anti-racism statutes in European countries um, or even in the US you know the international solidarity movement is very involved in a lot of these activities and yet they've also been found to collaborate with terrorist groups on numerous occasions yet they can they're uh, t they're considered a tax-exempt charity in the US 
So that's also another avenue. Um, in the U.S., they had a very important Supreme Court decision over the summer that um, it was illegal for, for groups to give material support to terror organizations, and that could include these types of legal activities. So there are means by, that people could probably start utilizing to combat um, demonization. I'm not quite sure why no one's been doing it, but <laughs> by a lot of money, maybe I would. <laughs> The ultimate question. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jack. First, Anne, thank you very much for your lovely presentation. I apologize that I came in a few minutes late. I'd like to relate to the point which uh, Professor Yisraeli made uh, about asymmetrical warfare and the object and how it's fought and how lawfare and incitement fit in. The, one of the major goals of this of asymmetrical warfare, where the weaker side takes on the larger side, is to keep the issue open. Mm -hmm. they, are, they want to prevent a quick resolution of their grievance. So the use of lawfare and BDS are ways of keeping their grievance, which is an unlimited agreement, a grievance which nobody can satisfy, but they want to keep their grievance at the top of the world's agenda. And that's how the lawfare uh, fits in. So we are looking at the matter with the time frame, which is too short. If we have to look at it, we have to look at history sur la longue durée. Mm -hmm. In other words, history over the long duration, we have to look at it in 20-year intervals. It was 20 years since Oslo things that happened and were said 20 years before haven't changed. We find that 40 years later, if one looks at what the, our, our Palestinian friends were saying, they were saying the same things. Very little has changed. So we look at the matter with too brief a time frame. So we're at war. You know, that's what asymmetrical warfare is. These are people who are looking for our complete destruction. Uh, so if we look at it that way, yes, it's sure as hell worth the fight. Mm -hmm. We have to fight the fight and maybe even more. And the work which you're doing is wonderful and desirable and mavurah. <laughs> so that's it. And we have to understand the type of war that we're fighting. And we have to look at it for every opportunity to put our uh, adversary at a disadvantage. And if we can, to stop our adversary, ultimately, it's not just about winning little cases, our goal should be to stop our adversary. Mm -hmm. yeah. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think that is uh, words of thanks better than I can express them, so let's give Anne a hand.